good to be in camp meeting, isn't it? I wouldn't want to live in camp meeting all the time. It's good to have a local church, but it's good to come see other folks, see what they think, see what they act like. Amen. Some of it makes me feel better. Some of it makes me feel worse. Uh, Brother Tickle and I were talking about a measure, and uh, there is a measure. Somebody said uh, the word standard is not in the Bible. There's people, there's some people know more what's not in the Bible than to know what's in the Bible. <laughs> but the truth is, where it says measure, the word is canon. We have each been given a canon, which is the word used to measure something to see whether it is right. Amen. So every man does have a standard. And uh, God has a standard. In fact, Paul says, if he doesn't measure up to this canon, don't have anything to do with it. Paul said that I didn't. Amen. All right? Is it all right for me to be tough if the Bible's tough? Amen. It would be a strange book if, uh, if uh, the Lord would write it for this present age the way they'd like for it to read. There'd always be a real soft addendum, you know, something that would make it easier and uh, much lighter. God bless your heart. You may be seated. Uh, I enjoyed service last night, and uh, Brother Bayer says it's not as easy for him as people think it is. That that's like Paul. He said, "I." Uh, I didn't use my education, but the fact is God used it. And uh, the Lord, uh, whether a preacher intends or will say it, God used is what he is. And uh, I believe that the Lord certainly has blessed us with great ministries. Talking to brethren yesterday, it's, uh, it's high time that we recognize ministries and give them credit, not not glory, that belongs to God, but the fact that he is trying to help different parts of the church with different ministries. And one of the biggest problems we have, and I'll say this lightly, is jealousy. Amen. And I was uh, a conversation, I believe, was talking to Brother Price, the family and visitation. My advice to people that have problem with jealousy, if you see somebody that does something better than you, go up. Tell them how good it is. Be specific. Buy into it. Be part of that. And that way you're not left out. You back off in a corner and try to run it down, you're in bad shape. But buy into it. Be part of that. That's part of me. Paul says, all things are mine. Whether life, death, all things are mine. Thank God. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, we're going to um, go to the Scripture in just a moment. I've... Uh, told you uh, it was a wonderful thing for me that uh, last year in August, I think it was, wife and I were able to go to Europe and with the Institute of Dead Sea Scroll, Scroll Studies uh, to study and um, be given some uh, of those texts at a uh, professor, Amnon Bintar from Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And uh, he was coming directly from uh, an archaeological dig in Hatzar, which is above Galilee. And he was giving to us some of the things they had discovered there as far as scrolls and as far as archaeology was concerned. And I'll be telling you some of those things and how it will fit with uh, different messages that I'll give to you. But uh, one of them, uh, he's digging uh, at a fortress of uh, Israel, 
they had fortresses at different places, extreme of the kingdom, uh, above Galilee into Lebanon, a place called Hutzar, digging down to uh, the uh, period, Philistine, Israel period. And um, they found uh, a temple of Dagon. They discovered they were in the temple of Dagon. And they found his head. <clears throat> That's all they found of him, first of all. And uh, he picked up his uh, Hebrew Bible and found where the Ark of the Covenant had been brought into uh, Ash, thought it was then, and uh, set up beside uh, the image of Dagon. And uh, they came in the next morning, you remember, that Dagon had fallen over. So they set their God up again. It's pitiful when you've got to set him up again, you know. Keeps falling over. And uh, always in conquering, uh, the first thing that would happen when uh, a king would conquer uh, a strange land, their gods, they would break their head off and their hands. And uh, this was a sign of of conquering the entire people. So he found the head of Dagon and he read where it had fallen over before the Ark of the Covenant. He said, let's keep digging. They kept digging and they found uh, the rest of Dagon and his hands were gone. And like uh, the Scripture said, there was nothing there but just the body form. And uh, it was quite amazing to me to learn that they're finding things to be true now that happened so many thousands of years ago. I believe just before the Lord comes, they're going, to, they're going to find out a whole lot of things. When it's too late to do anything about it. Faith has you believe it before you see it. Oh, the faith of Him that is not seen, but he believed, he rejoices with joy that's inexpressible and it's full of brilliance. Praise God. It's, it's full of splendor. Are you ready for the Word of the Lord today? I make no demands as far as you run in the aisle. Or, uh, I don't necessarily judge my message by uh, how many uh, amens I'm getting, but... Uh, I understand that sometimes people are learning. If they're learning, they are quieter. But if they're dead, they don't learn. That makes a difference altogether. I know you're not that way. I've seen you move about. Hey, the Lord's moving in this meeting, isn't He? Praise God. Praise God. And I believe there's a healer in the house. Amen. I'm going to Second uh, Corinthians, the twelfth uh, chapter, and uh, I'll begin reading the first verse, and uh, of course I'll be reading from the um, Greek text. Be able to follow me along, I trust. Second Corinthians, post Corinthians B. 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. It is necessary for me to boast, but it does not get it together for me. But I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ before 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I do not know. Whether outside the body, I do not know. God knows. Such a one was snatched up or raptured into the third heaven. I know such a man, whether in the body or whether outside the body, I do not know. God knows. Because uh, he was raptured into paradigm, to paradise, and heard words which are too sacred to speak and that are not lawful for a man to speak. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on behalf of myself, I will not boast except in my weaknesses. 
For if I uh, wish to boast, I shall not be foolish, because I am speaking the truth and I do not lie. Only that you don't consider me beyond what you see and hear. And because of the excessive revelation, there was given to me a scolops, a thorn in the flesh, an angel of Satan, in order that he may slap me around, lest I be lifted above what is good for me. Everybody say amen. amen. You may be seated. I give you the subject today, excessive revelation. But because of uh, two things, lest you consider me more than what you see or hear, and because of excessive revelation, hyperbole, surpassing, exceeding, excessive, reaching beyond what anyone may know. Because of that, there was given to me a angelos of satanus. There was given to me a messenger of Satan uh, to slap me around, lest I be lifted above what is good for me. I, uh, Paul didn't say no one else could have that experience. But before I'm through, you may wonder, and you may want to think about it a while before you ask for it. Amen. Now, he uses uh, the first person and the third person in reference to such a man. Actually, uh, and he uses a perfect uh, tense in the verb, I know a man. If it had been, as we are familiar, I knew a man, that would have simply been an action of the past. But with the perfect, it is an action that started back then, but it continues up to now. I still know him. Amen. And uh, we come to find out that it was actually himself. But he actually says that it was another man. And the only way to know that man was in Christ. There's another you, and you'll never know him unless you get so deep in Christ that there is an excessive revelation, and you won't know whether you are in or out of this body. Amen. Now... I believe that Paul actually experienced the rapture uh, before the end time. Because he uses the same word, hotpadzo, snatched away, stolen away. The same one that he uses when he talks about, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in the moment in the or in the atom, in the blinking of an eye, we shall be stolen out of here. Praise God. I preached at a general conference one time, and a man come up and asked me, said, Do you believe in two comings of the Lord back to earth? I said, No. Uh, first time he comes, he's not coming all the way back to earth. We're going to rise to meet him in the air. He said, then you believe in a secret coming of the Lord? I said, I do. He said, do you have Scripture? I said, enough to choke a mule. The Word says that we shall be stolen out of here, snatched away. The Word is used for the base word for the word rob or robbery. Take it when somebody don't know you in there. That's the way it's going to be. Amen. I thank God I believe in a rapture. The, uh, the uh, central pole that uh, many charismatics are being drawn to now is the doctrine of kingdom now. That is, that there won't be a rapture, 
that God is going to just convert this whole world and everything's going to get better here and, and we'll just go on with life here on the earth. I'm like J. Sidlow Baxter. If that's the way it is, oh my soul, I'm looking for much better than this. Amen. But the truth is, Paul says, I'm going to show you a musterion, a mystery. Musterion is something that's heretofore unknown. Now, resurrection was not a mystery. The Jews believed in that, except the Sadducees, and they didn't believe fat meat was greasy. But uh, they, uh, uh, they believed in resurrection. But he said, I'm going to show you something else. We're not all going to sleep, but we're going to be changed. Amen. Thank God. Standing flat-footed, something's going to come over me one of these days, and I'm going to feel my feet leave the ground. And when I do, I just want to lean back and take it easy and tell the devil, kiss my foot, I've made it in. Praise God, it's all over with. Some way or another, we're going to start out from different places, but we're going to meet together with the Lord in the air. Amen. Look over here and finally begin to recognize the closer we get to Him, the closer we get to one another and say, well, there's Brother Jones. I didn't think he was going to make it. Praise God. He did. <laughs> I can pick on him all I want to. Amen. I, uh, I, I feel like that uh, Paul is telling us about a rapture experience, and therefore he was able to tell us later on that there would be a rapture. He is the one that spoke of a rapture. Jesus did not refer to a rapture, but resurrection. Nobody else did. He said, I'm showing you this mystery. But the biggest thing about it is, I suppose, and the reason is that he kept mentioning it, and I think that maybe during the rapture this is what will be on our minds mostly. Is this me? Am I, am I in this body, or, or is this somebody else? That's why he says, I know a man. In Christ. That's the only way you'll ever know it. I believe as well as I'm standing here today, there is another me that is immortal, eternal, and knowable by access through the Spirit of God. You'll never know him through psychology. You'll never know him through uh, acquaintances. You'll never know him through social gatherings. The only way you'll ever know that other man is in Christ. I just might at the first of this ask, has anybody ever had an experience so far that you've got the inkling, you saw somebody that was sort of like you, but he was different than you, and you went out of the building walking on air saying, is this me? All right. Don't answer that. It's all right. But he said, I know a man. But it was excessive revelation. It was the ultimate revelation. He said, I was caught up into the uh, third heaven, Trituareno. That uh, is where God dwelt. And I heard things that are too sacred to tell. And we'll come to it in just a little bit. And it is excellent. It is unlawful for a man to tell. Amen. Now, uh, somebody says, I hear criticism, speaking in tongues is a lot. It's not a language, it's a bunch of gibberish. How do you know? Paul says there are tongues of men and angels. Have you ever heard an angel? He said, I heard things that's too sacred for a man to tell. Praise God. And uh, this was the third heaven. Now, he called it used another word besides the third heaven. He called it paradim. Paradis, the Greek, but it is from the Hebrew paradim, which means a beautiful park or a garden, such as Eden. I was in this beautiful park or garden, and I heard things that are unlawful. Now, 
flesh and blood, he says, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The reason he knows another man is because flesh and blood can't get there. I can prove to you, and maybe I will in the course of this meeting, that Adam and Eve changed as far as constitution of body after they sinned. He was first of all not Adam, but he was the son of Enoch, human being. After he sinned, he said, now you're going to sweat. And to the lady, now you're going to bleed. Amen. But he became Adam, or blood, later. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Sometime when we've got lots of time, let's talk about what they must have been like. Amen. When they were in the garden. But uh, however, the Lord put, the Hebrew says, a whirling devastation at the gate of the garden where nobody could get back in there. See, there were two trees there. One was the tree of knowing right and wrong. They ate that one. The Lord put a whirling devastation at the gate where they in their body could not go back in and eat of the tree of life and live forever in that condition. It is the mercy of God that we do not live forever in this body. There is another man, me. Hallelujah. There is another me. Praise God. And that only comes with excessive revelation. I don't claim to have had it, but I'm studying what this man has said about it, and I want it so bad I can taste it. Hallelujah. Lift me up, Lord. Plant me in that if you can. Glory to God. I tell you, longevity is built for eternity and for the, for the spiritual man. How would you like to meet? You're talking about Methuselah, my wife's great uncle. Uh, our uncle used to call him old Hoosley. How would you like to meet a pickpocket that had been in business for 600 years? How, how would you like to meet a liar that had been doing it for about a thousand years? He can fool you in a minute. Amen. It's the grace of God that keeps us from living in eternity with this flesh and blood. Amen. That's why the hotpazo, hotpage, the rapture will be in a body that when you are in this one, you can't determine whether it's me or him. Which one is this? Praise God. But he said two things. Lest you think of me more than what you see and hear. And we should never do that to any preacher. Hello? They are not more than what they, what you can see and hear. Oh, in God they are, but we're going to have to leave it up to Him to give us that. I don't mean we don't have confidence in them. But we don't make gods out of them, and we don't treat them like they are already in the third heaven. Amen? Uh, You have to deal with me just like a body, just like you are. We're not in the third heaven yet. But uh, he said that's one reason. And the other reason is because of the excessive revelation. Because this revelation was excessive beyond anything else. I was given a scolops. The word is a medical word. We call it a thorn, but it's a medical word mostly used for some sort of weakness. It was used some by Hippocrates for uh, epilepsy, but mainly for fainting spells. And I, I'm not saying what was what wrong with Paul. He does talk about his weaknesses in the flesh, whether that was, um, uh, you know, hypothetical or what, I'm, uh, or analogical, I don't know. But uh, I do know that he said, because of this excessive revelation, I was, I was given this thing in the flesh, 
And it may be uh, explained in the next statement, an angel, a messenger of Satan to slap me around, following me around, slapping me, keep me down. Amen? He followed me around. I had to have it. And he said, I prayed three times about it. Almost like that was some sort of record. You know, I thought, dear, dear me, I've prayed, I've prayed three years for things. I've prayed <laughs> all of my life. And he thought he was really busting some record by saying I prayed three times about it. Uh, brother, it lets you in a little bit on the power of the man called Paul and what his prayer must have been. I prayed three times about it. And the Lord said, no, uh, not going to take him away from you. But my grace is good enough for you. The Greek reads, my grace is good enough for you. So it may be that if you want an, such an excessive revelation, you might have to have a messenger of Satan following you around, slapping you all the time, keeping you down where you need, unless you be lifted above what is good for you. Somebody said, that's not our problem. Amen. I understand that. But I do believe that God gives us things because in growing in the Spirit of God, it's possible for us to be lifted up within ourself, and He has such a way of bringing us down. Amen? Oh, thank God. How many believe in the rapture? You believe in that. Glory to God. I, I, am, I am convinced that he was talking about the rapture of the church. But he said uh, it, its words are too sacred and it is unlawful. I've always wondered what was against the law and what law was he talking about. Was it the law of Moses? Well, I still don't know except this. If you, if he tells you, then you're going to have to have a messenger of Satan following you around to slap you. That's the reason he couldn't tell you about it. There are some things that we can't know unless we get to know this other man in Christ. We cannot eat of that tree of life and live forever in this body. Amen. It can't be done. He doesn't want it. It is so different that He will even make you think and you will feel that it is a different body altogether. Paul says, I'm being merciful. I'm not going to tell you about it. I'm not going to tell you what I heard. I'm not going to tell you what it is like because you'd have to have the same thing. Praise God. You say, what does that do for me? Well, for first thing, it just tells you how great it is. I'm telling you, if it's such a thing that in order to keep me from floating around and somebody having to tie a rope to me and pull me down every now and then, thank God, it, it must be something out of this world. But uh, the description by the Jews and the Talmud and the different writings of Paradigm and what it was supposed to be, I personally believe it was the Garden of Eden. I believe that it was that original state of uh, eternity in man, I believe, and you all you need to do is read about that. They kept the garden. They were in the presence of God that was with them. Amen. There was no fear. There was uh, there was nothing that would hurt nor destroy. Amen. I uh, I am convinced that uh, there is a place in God. Someday we're going to know about it. Amen. But. In order for me to get there, I've got to put up with a few things, and he lets me wrestle with this other man, this aggravating man, this ugly one, this bald-headed one, you know. Amen. He lets me wrestle with him until I have learned one step at a time how to conquer him and how to put him down and how to let some man I have not seen fully yet some creature that I have not let let out of the box, but I have got 
a, a, a feeling, an intuitive consciousness. I've got it on the inside that He is there. And I am in the business of conquering this one to let this one come out more and more and more and more. Hallelujah to God. Amen. Excessive revelation. Paul believes, and the Jews believe, that one thing that man had before he fell was a shine to his face. Seven things the Jews say man lost in the fall, and one of them was stature, another was a shine to his face. Uh, let, me, uh, let me go back, if I will, and correct something that's in their mind, and preachers will want to uh, remember this. Uh, it's very important. You know, it says, Moses came down from the mountain and his face shone, and he wore a veil till he finished speaking. Look in your Bible and you see the word till is italicized, that it was not there originally. Because of the difficulty, we now know that the word is when, not till. He put a veil on his face when he finished. Speaking. And Paul tells us the reason for it. He said he did not want the sons of Israel to gaze into that which was being done away with and was fading. It's all right to look at it while the glory was there, but when that shine began to leave, Moses put a rag on it where they couldn't see what was left. Amen. He put a veil on his face when he finished. And in training in Greek uh, and, and Hebrew, you don't use when so much. It's rather ambiguous, but uh, translate like an, uh, an aorist participle by the word after. He, he put a veil on his face after he finished speaking. And Paul says the reason for that is he did not want them to see that glory fading, which would signal to them that it was not permanent, it was ending, it was leaving, it was going away. I tell you, when the glory of God's gone, you can hang a rag on it. Amen? What's left can't be compared with what was there to start with. Amen? I've seen a lot of people, when the shine was gone and the glory was gone, to keep on trying to make you think that it's still there. Amen? And they are the ones responsible for it. And they just keep a shining. Hang it up! Put a rag over it! When the glory is gone, amen, you can just forget it. There is no comparison. He put a veil on his face after he finished speaking. The reason I say again is because he did not want them to look into or keep gazing at that which was fading. He didn't want them to see the fading process. But he said, you and I, with boldness, go day against day. And we look at ourselves. The word is that we examine ourselves in a mirror. Hmm. We do it very boldly, not not carefully. We don't walk up there with trepidation, afraid we're going to see something. But boldly, we walk up to a mirror and we look in there and we see we see ourselves being changed into His image. Praise God! It's not fading. But he said, we are being changed into his image from brilliance to brilliance, from shining to shining. Oh, glory. Have you got the secret? Moses hung a rag over that which was dying and fading. And he said, and the Jews, when they read the law now, still have that rag over it. It is still fading. It is still done away with. They can't revive it. There's only one way to revive it, and that's go back to the top of the mountain where God is. Hallelujah. Oh, blessed experience that you and I have. We don't have to go back to the top of the mountain, but He lives in us. 
And day after day, it does not fade. We go back to the mirror and we look at ourselves and we watch ourselves not fading, but we watch the glory of God as it goes greater and we are changed into His image day against day. Praise God from glory unto glory. I'm preaching to you again today. You're either moving toward Him or you're moving away from Him. One another. There is no static. There is no still place in God. Hallelujah. Every experience that happens to you is for the purpose of moving you closer to Him. It'll either serve to move you closer or it'll move you farther away one of the other. Before I'm through in this camp meeting, you're going to believe, as I said yesterday, that we are in the image of God. In fact, I'll show you tomorrow that we're just this far from Elohim. Praise God. Just a little bit from Elohim. Thank God. And we can be changed into His image day by day. Oh, glory! Sometimes I think how far behind I am, the apostle, when it comes to that change. He, the Lord helped him leapfrog a lot of things and put him right there in the third heaven. And he heard all of this, but he said, you can't stand that in this body. And if you have that kind of an experience, you're going to have for the rest of your life something in your body that will drag you down and keep you from lifting yourself up and being lifted up above what is actually good for you. I use, I have no personal reference to myself, but sometimes I believe God, God does not deliver us from life. He heals and He blesses, but He lets you get older. That's coming. How many is getting older? Nod your head, shake your bush, do something. Let me know that you're out there. Praise God. He does not deliver you from life. I don't care, ma'am. It is getting wrinkled. It really is. And I don't care how you color it up. It's turning color. And I don't care, sir, if you put a mop on the front of it. It really isn't there. Oh, my, 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 my. Somebody said, well, I want to look better. Why? Why are we so intent on making... All I want to do is keep this thing moving, that's all. Keep it moving. Praise God. Did you know Paul says that he thanks he thanks the Galatians that they put up with his weakness in the flesh. It was such a weakness, he said, that when other people saw it, they wanted to spit out. Amen. I, some folks say it was extremely ugly. I don't know what it was, but he told the Galatians that, that whatever was wrong with him made people want to spit out when they saw him. We are so, we are so concerned about being pretty in this. Hey, brother, there is another you. I'm asking you again. Do you know a man in Christ that's called such a man? Hallelujah. Such a man that moves every day from one glory to another glory. The word doxe is splendor or brilliance or reflection. Praise God. When you look in the mirror, you ought to see whether your hair is, is getting more full or whether your wrinkles are scooting out. You ought to be saying, is this moving towards such a man that I need to be? Is that man coming out? Hallelujah to God. I can judge it by my kindness. I can judge it by my prayerfulness. I can judge it by my attitude toward His Word. I can judge it by how much I love His Word and His worship. I can judge it by how much time I like to spend in the presence of God. I'm telling you, the real child of God that has a real revelation and are being changed into His image from day to day, they'd rather be in a red-hot service. They'd rather stay in the presence of God than anywhere else at any time. I am 
excuse me, I am, I am, I am rather amused by some things I see people trying to make themselves pretty. I see old men out uh, with their old scrawny legs out trying to wear shorts out around. I laugh every time I see that. Poor old thing. Amen. Amen. I just, I, I, and I see grandmas, you know. Grandmas that ought to be sitting in a rocking chair looking sweet and humble, out trying to flaunt around and flop around and uh, dressed in shorts and not enough really uh, to cover them up. And, 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 and like the Scripture says, gray hair are here and there and they know it not. Absolutely oblivious to it. They, they think if they lose this, if they, if it keeps on going down, I'm losing everything. Oh, what a blessing it is to have an excessive revelation to know that there is another me. Praise God. There is another man that I can know in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to God. And that is a powerful man. That is a man that is brilliant and shining and glorious. Woo. Hallelujah to God. Thank God. I, I'm just going to ask you to step out on faith tonight and remember if you've ever seen yourself in the presence of God and how you look, how He's changed you, what He's making out of you. You can at least do that. Thank God. And give me a wave of your hand to let me know you understand what I'm talking about here today. Whoa! Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I know a man. Thank God. Listen, that perfect tense is such a powerful element in the Greek. It's tied down. It's culminated. It is finished. It's done. I know him. It's guaranteed. I've seen it. I've met him. Thank God I'm acquainted with him. Oh, brother, what would you give to meet the spiritual you? What would you give to see yourself in the third heaven? What would you give to know what it was like for you to be in the presence of God, shining and brilliant with sacredness that's too much to tell? What would you give to meet you in another world, in a paradigm? How would you like tomorrow to wake up in paradigm? Praise God! A beautiful park. And say, is this me? Am I really here? Thank God! Is this really me? Is this me walking around here? Hallelujah to God! Who wants that old body anyhow? Thank God for deliverance from that old body. Thank God for the deliverance from that old pain. Amen. Hallelujah to God. I'm feeling it. Hallelujah. Amen. After after five back surgeries, and I have to mention that because I need sympathy and and uh, and I need it real bad. But after five back surgeries, I see some of you running around here like this was a racetrack, and I say, "Oh, glory, glory, glory! Just wait till I get mine. Hallelujah! Just wait till I get mine. I want you to start out with me. I've got preachers, uh, brother Jones." That remember when I was youth president of Louisiana, I made rules. You line up to go to the kitchen. You don't run and get ahead of somebody else. If you boys run, I'm going to outrun you, and I'm going to get in front of the line and put you in the back. There are preachers that will walk up to me now and tell everybody, that this man used to be the fastest man I ever saw. He caught me in line. He passed me up and got in front of the line and made me go to the back. Amen. Oh, yeah. I used to be, but I ain't no more. But one of these days, we're going to draw a line in paradigm. Amen. And I'm going to say, brother, you running around this auditorium, let's start right from here. I'll show you what fast is. <laughs> Amen. Oh, glory to glory. Amen. We're changed in His presence. But um, uh, I told my doctor, I said, if they ever get to transplanting backs, he said, Reverend, he said, they're working on it. I said, wonderful. If they ever get to transplanting them, I want you to find me somebody with a number four hat and a number 12 shoe. And I want his back. You know, he's got a little head and he's got big feet. He's all back. You know what I mean? Guy don't know how much he can lift. Just get me that. Oh, glory. I'll have a new body. I'll have a new life. Not a new wife. A new life. Oh, glory. 
Oh, brother, I have been in the presence of God enough. I have not had such a revelation as Paul had. But I've been in the presence of God enough that I know there is another me. And I want it. I want it. I want it. And I am ready for it, for it to come to me. Woo! Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm going to take the words that Paul and Peter used writing their letters that nobody else used. They might have discussed many more things, but I'm going to use just the words that they used that nobody else used. And, oh, brother, if you remember, I found and I discovered some things. They agreed on how the women should dress, amen, and how they should act. Oh, yes, 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 yes. They agreed on that. They agreed on uh, uh, on that the blood does not sprinkle, but it is ruo. It flows. Praise God. They agreed on the thief in the night. Words and words and words. And I went through. I've already preached that. Amen. But there's one thing I want to go back and pick up. And that is Peter had such an experience as Paul. And he used it as a prize pole. And he said false prophets and teachers are going to come in. But I want to tell you one thing. I was an eyewitness of his suffering. I was there. I'm so glad we've got somebody in the Bible that stood up and said, Brother, I saw it with my own eyes. I was there. You don't have to say you believe in the resurrection or in the crucifixion, but I saw it with my own eyes. Hallelujah to God. The preeminence of an eyewitness. I saw it. Oh, praise God. I saw it with my own eyes. Don't you let somebody else come to you. He said, now, even our beloved brother Paul. Thank God. Amen. You're talking about a spirit. Now, this is the Paul that stood up in front of him and rebuked him to his face and said, you're a Jew and, and uh, you get in front of a... Gentiles, you don't have anything to do with them. You build again things you destroy them, except transgress. On and on and on. Amen. But when Peter writes after that, he said, Our beloved brother Paul. Thank God. When you actually have had an experience in God, somebody can rebuke you when you need it, and you still say, Thank God, my beloved brother. He said, Our beloved brother Paul, some things he writes hard to understand. Uh, don't you know it is? Especially when you've been rebuked by him. Amen. But another reason is the difference between the writing of a lawyer and a fisherman. That's the difference. You can uh, people doesn't realize, but uh, their writing is as easy to uh, cipher and tell the difference as it is from a you know a, an illiterate man in our day and from a, a professor in our day. Amen. The wonderful thing about Jesus Christ was he could talk to anybody. Amen. He could talk to the illiterate, and they were impressed. One time, the elders, 7th chapter of John, the elders of the Jews sent to arrest Jesus. And when they got there, they found Him talking. And you read it in Greek, and it's powerful. He flows between the tenses in the Greek. He speaks of Himself in past tense. He speaks of Himself in present tense. And He speaks of Himself in future tense. In the, in the uh, future perfect, as though he is already there. He flowed between the tenses. Uh, and when uh, those guys stood there with their hands to their side, when they got back to the uh, elders and the uh, people that sent them to arrest them, uh, hey, they said, where's the man we sent you to arrest? The only answer they gave was, never a man spake like this man. You know what the Bible said? They questioned how does this man have gramaha, the accent of intelligence, never having learned? Well, if he wanted to, he could talk. Nobody would understand it. I mean, if he didn't accommodate himself to our little finite mind and thought, he could talk about equations and he could talk about probabilities and he could talk about truths that are out in space of time and, and eternity and, and all, and we'd never know where it is. Praise God. But they thought he had to either go through the school of Shammai or he had to go through the school of Hillel or he had to go through one of their rabbinic schools before he'd have the accent of intelligence. They said, how does this man have an accent of intelligence? He's never gone to one of our schools. Schools, brother, there are other schools other than your school. 
be careful when you talk about a man how much he knows but because he might have been caught up into the third heaven and be able to talk about things that nobody else knows about. Hallelujah to God. Oh, glory, I've seen an old dumb Frenchman, third grade education, speak one night, and I was in his presence, when a college professor came up to him and said, uh, would you please uh, uh, tell me uh, that it's correct? He said, I told my wife tonight, you are listening to a very learned man. And Brother Gidrow told him, sir, I went to the third grade. He was uh, incredulous. He couldn't believe it. There are schools, and then there are schools. But I'm going to tell you, the best kind of school is when he can lift you into such a place that you get to know about a deal that nobody else has ever seen. Teach your language. Teach your habits. Teach your words. Teach your thoughts. Teach your comparisons. Teach your knowledge. He can teach you things you never heard before. Amen? When you, uh, when you, I, I forget uh, the words in the order, but one, when you are rab, that means in Hebrew that you, um, you just read the Scripture, able to read them for what they are. But when you are rabbi, that means that you are able to apply some application of that into people's lives. But when you are Rabboni, that means that you can take it all and you can spiritualize the whole thing. Totally. Uh, an analogy. And make illustration out of it all. And that's, that's where their schools led you. How to take it and make it totally spiritual where it doesn't mean a thing to anybody. That is the accent of intelligence. Let me tell you something. Everything that he knows is real. And when they talked about him, they said he speaks not like the scribes. Amen. Because when you're telling a fairy tale and you're giving a parable, nobody knows where is the authority for uh, the analogy. Where is the basis? Where is the premises for its meaning? But this man speaks with authority. Hallelujah. I'll tell you why later on he's got that authority. But Peter, I was on him. He had, he had a wonderful experience. He said, I saw it. I saw it. Not only was he an eyewitness to his uh, crucifixion and resurrection, but he said, I was an eyewitness to his megalotane, to his majesty, to his transmorphe to him changing from one being into another. I saw that. Oh, glory. Now, if you see that somewhere on a dark night, you probably leave, you know. It's, it's like two men on the Emmaus Road. All of a sudden, they were just joined by somebody. If I'm walking along the road and all of a sudden I'm just joined by somebody, they can have the road. I'll give it to them. Amen. I'll leave it all to them. But... but but uh, Peter said, I saw that majesty. Mm, I heard a voice. An excellent, a superb voice. Woo! Wouldn't you like to hear him sing? Mm. Glory to God. Wouldn't you like to hear him sing? Did you know one of, one of Ben Shakar, that's son of the morning, Lucifer, Hallel, wouldn't you like to know all about him? Did you know what? It says of him in the beginning, his pipes. That means his musical instruments were perfect. But look what they've done to it now. He's messed them up now, hadn't he? You know, in the book of Revelation, it tells about people talking about when Babylon is fallen, everybody, different people say, the world is sad and weeps because 21 items are gone that they'll never have anymore. Ships, bread, corn, clothes, and so on. They weep about that. You know what the angels are glad of? We're glad Babylon's gone because it was the hold of every foul spirit. You know what the apostles in the church sing about? Thank God the noise of her music is gone. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'll be so bad when they stop that bump and grind, I don't know what to do. 
I have no criticism for anybody, and I'm not being judgmental, but I don't think rock has any place in the church whatsoever. Sing down from His glory. Hallelujah. Hey, Amen. Sing something, brother, that I can understand the Word. I'm anxious to hear that superb voice from another world. Hallelujah to God. He said, I saw Him move, change. In one place, He said, His clothes became white and glistening as no soap maker is able to make them. I mean, you get the best soap maker in Jerusalem, and he couldn't get his clothes whiter than what they were right there. They were white and glistening. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. I saw that with my own eyes. And he said, now, he said, now, I'll tell you what it is. It is, this is the original. This, it, we have the firm prophetic word. You want to know why Jesus had a transfiguration? A lot of people don't know what it's for. It wasn't just so He could show three men. Well, it wasn't in one sense. But, brother, He was showing you it was possible to move from one body to an earth, from an earthly body into another body. Praise God, praise God. And Peter said, now because I saw that, we have the firm prophetic word. You want to know what the firm prophetic word is? That I'm going to be changed. Hallelujah to God. That there is another me. And I know this man in Christ Jesus. And someday I'm going to put on. If I have borne the image of the earthly, I shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Hallelujah. Let's put on Christ, if you will. Everything even to His mind. Let the mind, the noose, from which you get neurology. Let the noose be in you, which was in Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm not through yet. Here's the best part of the whole shebang. We have the firm prophetic word. When you're preaching on prophecy, I want to know about Russia, but I'm not going to die with Russia. I want to know about uh, the, the uh, beast of the end time, but he's going to burn one of these days. Amen. I know he's there. I, I want to hear about some chrono chronology and some sequences of time. But the best thing, if you're going to give me the prophetic word, prove to me how that this being can change into another being and be something else. He said, now we have the firm prophetic word which shines. Listen to it. It shines like a lamp in a murky place. Dirty and murky. Thank God. He said, my testimony, this prophetic word, this belief that we're going to change, amen, is like a lamp that's shining in a murky place. Thank God. And it's going to shine until the word in Greek is until the phosphorus rises in our heart. Amen. Never translated day star anywhere else. But the word is phosphorus. How many knows what phosphorus is? It's a chemical that shines of itself. It has a built-in light. Amen. Amen. One fellow said, well, they didn't know what phosphorus was back then. Tell me. They lived around lakes. They knew. You can see it shining in the water sometimes. Whether they did or not, the word still means the same thing. Foes is light. Foes is light. Pharaoh is bare. It bears light of itself. Praise God. Here's what I'm telling you today. This firm prophetic word is shining like a lamp in a dirty place. Oh, this is a dirty place. But what we've got that I'm going to have a new body, thank God, is shining like a lamp in a dirty place. And it's going to keep shining until phosphorus rises in my heart. Hallelujah. One of these days, phosphorus is going to rise in our heart until we're going to take on a shine like came on Jesus Christ. 
Hallelujah. It happened in the face of Moses. It happened in the face of Jesus Christ. And Peter said, don't let anybody tell you different. I saw it with my own eyes. And it lets me know it's firm. And someday the phosphorus is going to rise in our heart. Hallelujah. I believe just before the Lord comes for His church, those that have got this other life inside of them, that phosphorus is going to start rising. Amen. And the Lord's going to have to get them out of here before they embarrass somebody. Oh, glory to God. You can already see it. You can spot them. There's something different about them. See them in an airport. See them anywhere. There's something different about them. I'll tell you what it is. It's phosphorus. It's a light from the inside. It's light that bears of itself till the phosphorus is rising. Brother, I feel like the phosphorus is rising today. Hallelujah to God. I believe it's a coming up and it's going to start changing us. And when it rises enough, I'm going to turn in to be a shining, glistening, body creature. Thank God, with clothes whiter than any soap maker is ever able to make them. Praise God. Here is the firm prophetic word. Thank God. And it's like a lamp in the murky place. I'll tell you what's keeping me going is I've got another body. Hallelujah to God. Thank God I can run that fast. Isn't that wonderful? Hallelujah to God. Amen. It's shining like a lamp in a murky place. And I feel the phosphorus rise. And sometimes I feel like, Lord, this is it. Hallelujah. It's a coming on me right now. It's a taking over. And I'm changing right now. Hmm. Well, I just ask you, have you ever had glory so great that you wondered, is this it? Hmm. Glory, is this the rapture? Is this me? Am I here? My son and I were at a, at a, at a uh, supper, sacrament supper, among a bunch of preachers. Some of you were there. Brother Urshan was leading it. Man, there been nobody but us. We were so crowded, didn't have chairs. We were standing. Big, huge room full of preachers standing. Thank God. And it was waves of glory. They didn't have to say anything. It just started the front and sweep toward the back. Amen. It would subside and it would come back toward the... Oh, He loves His preachers. Hallelujah. And it would start sweeping toward the back again. And all of a sudden, Rick was standing by me. I felt the floor vibrating under me. Amen. And Rick pulled on my coat. And here he was, a young preacher. And he said, "Uh, Daddy, you reckon this is the rapture? You reckon it's about to happen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said, just be still, son. Hallelujah. If it is, I want to know everything about it. Thank God. I don't want to be talking to nobody. I want to know the reality of it. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Brother, I believe phosphorus is rising in the hearts of the children of God. While others are going the other way, His people are having that thing rise within their hearts. Hmm. I tell you, right before he comes, he's going to have to get us out of there because he's going to say, I saw old Brother Jones, and he is shining like a light bulb. Praise God. Amen. His whole bald head was brighter than I've ever seen it before. Thank God. Isn't that wonderful? That's one time I'm going to be glad for it. Hallelujah. Thank God. Just let her shine, let her shine, let her shine. But lest I be lifted above what is good for me, I was given a scolops, an angel of Satan, to slap me around. I sometimes believe that it might have been the opinion of the Corinthian church that was his thorn in the flesh. Amen. He brought him in. He was the Father and the Lord. But they said he don't look like an apostle. He don't sound like an apostle. Amen. He's got contemptible speech. Got a, uh, the word is, his, his speech has got a bite to it. Amen. Thank God. And, and all together, he just don't look like an apostle. I don't know whether that's what it was or not. But lest you be lifted above what is good for you is given a scallops, a thorn in the flesh. Uh, I, I say this because, again, I, I, I'm calling for sympathy. We never get enough of that. Give us a Pass it on, pass it on, pass it on. 
but uh, I have known some pain. I, uh, I tell you about all, you want to hear about all my operations, don't you? I, lady in Baton Rouge came up to me at Baton Rouge, Louisiana, that night. She said, do you know me, Brother Teresa? I said, well, I'm not sure. And she said, I'm that lady that had the operation. I said, oh, yes, ma'am. I, yes. <laughs> Before the last one, they had one, they had one procedure. And it's the only thing I ever had to sign a, uh, a patient's rights form. That was that I had rights as a patient. It, it simply means this. When I tell them to quit, they have to. And start with four needles entering from the side into the spine, into the disc without any uh, anesthesia or without any deadening. And the idea is pain. When you get in there, you pressurize each disc to try to reduplicate the pain. <coughs> I, kept, I kept saying, I'm, I'm a bear hunter. I'm... I'm I'm tough. I'm a coon hunter. I'm yeah. Go ahead, stick me, Doc. I'm tough. I'm, I'm I really didn't. I just just about that far from invoking my rights, you know. <laughs> Brother Foss brought me a book the other day. He's had some of the same problem. The name of it was Pain: The Gift that nobody wants. And it was written by a, a Dr. Bundy, a Brandon or something, I forget his name. But he, uh, he was, uh, did research in India with the lepers. And he finally did work in the United States, very prominent now as an older man. <clears throat> but he's talking about how that uh, lepers... There's no such thing as bad flesh. They don't lose the end of their fingers because the flesh turns bad. Is They lose the sense of pain in their fingers. And so they will stick their hand in burning coals. They don't know they're picking up something hot. They don't know when it's cut off. They don't know when it's broken. Therefore, they become mutilated and they turn into claws. He learned how to rebuild that. This doctor did. But he said one of the first impressions, he saw a little girl, six to seven years old, brought to the doctor, festering blisters and sores on her feet, wrapped up. The doctor unwrapped her feet and began to take a probe and, uh, and gently press one of those. But the child looked around, was not bothered, went a little deeper. Still there was no response and finally just punched it all the way to the bone. The child never felt a thing. He described her condition, not leprosy, but something else. But the parents, when they first noticed it, when she was small, they saw her drawing with watercolors, it seemed, on the sheets. And when they got there, they were horrified to realize that it was her blood. She had bitten the end of her finger off and was writing using the blood to draw pictures on the sheet. She had no pain whatsoever. So they could not spank her. It wouldn't do any good. She learned that she could gross people out and get what she wanted. If her parents didn't do what she wanted them to do, she would threaten them to bite the end of her finger off. Her tongue was mutilated because she chewed it to show them. And, and so on. He's talking about pain preserves you. He said he saw a man in India whose leg was broken. There was a, somewhat of a wrapping on it, but he was a leper standing at the end of a line. All of a sudden, he got excited and wanted to run to the front of the line. And uh, without thinking about it, he ran on that foot. He, he didn't have any pain. He didn't ever feel that foot. So he started running. By the time he got to the front of the line, that foot was just hanging like that. And he was running on, what is it, the tibia, the bone, and, and uh, was being stuck with gravel. And he was running on that, did not know it. He is talking about pain helps you preserve. You would be mutilated. You would be crippled. You would be hurt if there was not pain. I'm telling you now that God, according to Paul, gives us pain sometimes so that He can perfect and teach us, hallelujah, and preserve that other man. Praise God. Amen. Somebody hurt my feelings. They talked about it. There's a reason behind it. 
Somebody said, when we get to glory, we're going to sit down and talk with Peter, Paul, and whoever. I don't know what kind of conversation that'll be. You know, Paul tell how he is in prison beaten. You'll tell about how somebody talked about you. Amen. James will talk about how they slew him with the sword, you know. And you'll talk about how you went to church and the preacher had the audacity to get up and take his text on you and preach on you. Poor thing. Hey, look, I imagine we'll find people that we can talk to that knows about some of the same thing. But the problem is this. Brother, we've got to have pain. Lest we're lifted above what we should be. There is a preservation of the other me because there is pain in this person. Hallelujah to God. Amen. Have you followed me so far today? Excessive revelation. How many want, don't answer, you want an excessive revelation? Thank God. I want all He'll give me. And I'll tell you something else. I believe it's good enough to have the pain. The other day, I was trying to write a book, and for those that don't know, I have them, I have them that sag in the floors at home. Books. But I was sitting and writing, the ones I've written. I was sitting writing and feeling sorry for myself and then having some difficulty. And all of a sudden, the sweet presence of God came over me. And a peace that nobody can ever describe. Everything was wonderful. It was such a peace. And on the heels of that, the Lord asked me, which one had you rather have? Amen. Though He slay me, yet I'll trust Him. It is better to enter heaven halt and crippled than to go to hell with a whole body. And I'm not preaching, and we, we believe it, and it's not even the subject today. We know God heals. But I'm talking about comparing this life with that other life. Isn't He wonderful? How many has He ever touched and blessed you in such a way that you just said, Take me on. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Take me on. I want to be with Him. To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus, on earth I long to be like Him all through life's journey from earth to glory. I only ask to be like Him. I'm going to let you decide that one by one. You think about it for a moment. Amen. Pain every day that you get up. Pain that can't be handled. Amen. Not only in, in just flesh, but I'm talking about sorrow. God taking somebody. Amen. Brother Jones, I had Brother Nelson look at me one time years ago across the table. My wife remembered it was a prophecy. He said, you're going down. And I did. Amen. But I am convinced of one thing more than anything else in this world. And that is this. That I'm willing to take what He sends me so that the glory can be revealed. Hallelujah to God. Give me, give me excessive revelation just so I can know it. But I'm going to let you decide today, and as you decide it, one by one, stand. Amen. Don't stand because everybody else is, but as you think it over, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, on earth I long to be like Him all through life's journey from earth to glory I only ask to be like 
Him. If you're ready for the trade, sing it out. To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. Oh. where you are, but you see by His Word today that whatever He gives you is, is worth it. Praise God. Or else maybe you want to say, teach me, Lord. Teach me how much better it is. Hallelujah. Teach me the gift of pain. And you want to walk down here, preacher, layman, whoever you are, you want to come and say, I've, I've complained, and I'm complaining now, and things are bad. I'm, I'm in a bad shape. Oh, some way or another, teach me, Lord. Let me have the revelation that, uh, that accompanies it. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask you the same question the Lord asked me the other day. Which had you rather have? Thank God. I think we ought to have a prayer before we leave today. Amen. Somebody ought to come down. Thank God you're in the throat. Maybe you got physical pain. Amen. Maybe maybe things are going against you, but just come on down. I don't care if you're a preacher or you're a Sunday school teacher or who you are. It doesn't make any difference. Just come on down and say, Lord, teach me all about it. I want to know why. Hallelujah. I've prayed about it three times, Lord. Tell me why your grace is good enough. Oh, glory to God. Let's have a prayer before we leave here today. Amen. Don't be afraid somebody's calling you a sinner. Just come on down.